it looked like somebody was bent over and had their head in the window of the deer blind. It either heard me or smelt me, and he pulled his head out of the tent and stood straight up, and that, that shocked me. They don't make people that, that big. The way it moved, uh, almost as if it was gliding across the beach. I've never seen anything move like that in my life. They were screaming at each other in gibberish. It sounded like a language and they were chuntering away back and forwards, back and forwards, back and forwards. I know what a bear looks like and there is no way on this planet that what I saw were bears. Hi, this is Carol King from Music City, and you're listening to Sasquatch Chronicles. Welcome to the show, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. Got a great show planned for you. Uh, We're going to be chatting with uh, James. And James comes to us. He grew up in Florida. Uh, James is a veteran. He's a former Marine. Uh, And like I always say, I don't think you're ever really a former Marine. Uh, But he is willing to come on the show tonight and kind of share what happened to him. He has a few encounters he wants to go through uh, while growing up in Florida. And we're also going to be chatting with uh, Mike. Mike comes to us from Michigan. And back in 1981, uh, he had an encounter with the creature. Uh, Very fascinating stuff tonight. If you've had an encounter and you'd like to be on the show, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. And if you get a chance to check out sasquatchchronicles.com, you can become a member and get additional shows. Uh, Let's jump into it tonight. I want to welcome James to the show. Uh, James, thanks for coming on. Oh, thanks, man. I appreciate you having me, man. Yeah, thank you again. And I know there's a couple of encounters we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, if you would, oh, I know all of this took place in Florida. Uh, take us back to the very first time you saw this creature. Kind of what were you doing and walk us into what happened. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. Um, so it was uh, in 2006. So my parents, um, we kind of live in, in a, a country area. It's not really that big of a city life. Um, it's right outside of Okeechobee, Florida, which is a really, really small town. That's where my dad had moved for work. And um, I had a, a girlfriend that lived there when I was 16. And she lived about two miles away from me. It was probably like close to 8.30, 9 o'clock at night. These backcountry roads don't really have, um, they don't really have too many lights or street lights and stuff like that. So I think my parents had made me mad that evening or something like that. So I just wanted to sneak out of the house and just kind of get away and just kind of clear my head and just kind of hang out with her for a little bit. So then I, um, I kind of called her on the landline because I, I didn't have a cell phone or anything like that. So I just kind of called her on landline and said, hey, like, why don't we just meet halfway and then we can just chat, hang out and talk and stuff. And she was like, yeah, sure. Like, we can do that. That'd be fine. So, um, so I kind of just act like I'm going outside to go play around and stuff. And being 16... My mom and dad, they had four other kids that they were worried about. So one kid missing wasn't really wasn't really that big of a deal, I guess. So and so I just kind of grabbed like a like a water or something like that and just started walking. There's only one hardball road that leads like like up and down the streets where we live. And just to kind of set the scene for the area. So it's there's probably about eight or nine houses along this two mile stretch on both sides. So they're they're pretty spread apart and they're kind of off the road a couple hundred feet. So most of the most of the way there is just really 
it kind of goes like pavement and then it kind of goes into the ditches and then it just goes into deep and and wooded areas with i'm talking like palmettos oak trees pine trees and just swamp and like kind of like marshy land so about i think i get about half a mile away and at this point you know i'm not I'm, i don't have a flashlight i don't have anything there's nothing really to you know kind of see my way there's a little bit of a moonlight not really a full moon but kind of maybe like a half moon so there's some ambient light to to where you can see but like in front of you but not really that well so and i get to this point in the road where it kind of takes a little curve not really much of a sharp turn but a little bit of a curve i look forward and probably i would say about 50 feet in front of me, 40 50 feet in front of me i see like something on the side of the road and i'm like you know, I mean, I'm not scared of the dark or anything like that, but I was just like, what the heck is that? There's not, you know, there's nothing, there should be nothing that close to the edge of the road because the trees were pushed off maybe 10 feet off. So you, before the brushes and everything started. So I kind of start, I'm just walking, not thinking much of it and stuff like that. And at the time I was probably like five, six, maybe 110 pounds at the most. So I was, I was a tiny kid, but, uh, as I'm starting to get closer to this uh, figure that I see on the side of the road, I realize within about 20 feet of it, I'm like, holy cow, this thing is a heck of a lot bigger than me. And I would say, as for like a size reference, I would say it was at least like seven feet tall. And I'm thinking like, no, there's no way this could be in. This can't be a person. There's no lights out here. There's nothing, there's nothing going on. Like there's no cars on the side of the road or anything like that. So I'm like, what the heck? So then like the little, you know, like the kind of like the hair on the back of your neck just starts standing up. And I'm like, oh, man, what is this? Is it a person? I hope it's a person like I'm thinking, you know, and I've grown up in Florida all my life. And, you know, I've I've seen hogs, deer, elk, the occasional wolf, coyotes and just all kinds of animals. And this thing just completely caught me off guard. I couldn't figure out what it was. So as I'm walking closer, I mean, I didn't panic or run anything like that at the moment. And I get about 10 feet away from it. And whatever this is, I didn't know what it was. I'm like, this thing is not moving. It's not, it's not trying to like go across the road. It's not trying to dart off into the bushes. It's just standing there. And I'm like, man, like, no, man, I'm not going to go out like this. Like, this isn't the way, like, like I didn't, I didn't plan to sign up for this. And I'm like, my, my girlfriend at the time, I'm like, she ain't that big. Like it can't be her. So at this point I make a conscious decision to be like, you know what? I think I'm just, my mind is playing tricks on me. So I try and stare away from it a little bit to kind of let my eyes adjust kind of a little more to see if maybe it's something that my eyes are seeing or something going on. And I realize this thing's not moving and it isn't going anywhere. So it's not my eyesight. It's not anything going on. So I just kind of panic. At this point, I'm like, kind of screw it. I'm just going to shoot on the left side of the road and run as fast as I can because I didn't want to turn around because I didn't really want to turn my back to it at that point of whatever it was. And I kind of just get into like a full sprint and run about, I would say, eight feet away from this thing as, as close as I was getting. The thing doesn't make a noise. It doesn't say and do anything. But as soon as I get close enough to it, I feel like I scared it just as much as it scared me. And this thing just takes off into the woods. Like I'm talking knocking down trees, brushes, everything in its path. And there's no houses around there. So I'm like, what the heck? So I just sprint and take off. And it's not like a normal area where you can just like, you know, it's not an open field where you can just kind of lollygag and run around and just run through this stuff. There's briar bushes. There's the palmettos have like barbs on them and stuff like that. So if you're running through that, you would immediately trip. But whatever this was, this thing took off so quick. I don't know if I screamed, but I probably did. And just kind of just took off as fast as I can. I ended up getting to my girlfriend's house before she had even started even trying to leave her house. We meet up and she has a cell phone. So she turns the light on. We start walking back and stuff. And we get to that same point and it's just eerily quiet. You know, you hear like crickets and stuff and frogs, but there's like literally nothing going on. But I didn't say nothing to her because, you know, I mean, I didn't want to seem like, you know, like I was scared or anything like that. So we kind of just walk past the same area, get back to the front part of my house. And I'm like, OK, like, so like I, didn't, I was like, I wasn't going to tell her about it. Like I was like, oh, uh, 
I hope she gets back home okay and everything like that. So I just kind of like, all right, well, I'll kind of see you because that just kind of ruined the whole evening. Like I didn't want to be out anymore. I didn't want to do anything outside at that point after that. So I just kind of go inside and then my parents are kind of like, where are you at? And I just told them like, hey, I was outside. So they never found out. So and to this point, I think I've told maybe one person about that at most. And he's kind of a weirdo too, kind of kind of like me. So he kind of understood it and he was very intrigued about it and stuff like that. So, so yeah, I mean, that was the, the first one. Yeah, that's a terrifying encounter, especially when you're 16 years old. I wanted to ask you, so when you, you're running towards it, you're trying to go around it. Um, as you got closer, um, I realize you're probably seeing an outline, but as you got closer, were you able to see any details? Um, the, the thing was pitch black. I know that, um, it, at, at the glance that I had at it, I mean, its arms were extremely long, like way longer than a normal human being should be. And kind of the makeup of the head, it was, it was hairy. Like it wasn't like bald or anything like that. So it was hairy. That's really all that I could make out. I mean, I, I just took a glance over. I was thinking I was more panicked than anything. So it wasn't like, I was like, oh yeah, let me take a look at this thing. Cause I was like 16 and I'm like, heck no, I'm out of here, dude. Like I was like, no, heck no. So. Yeah, I hear ya. Uh, can I ask you, you know, I, I realize that you're 16 at the time, but what kind of made you keep going? What made you go towards a creature? I realize you were going around it, but I mean, in the same direction of this thing, do you think just being 16 made you kind of make that decision? Which, don't take offense to that, I made a lot of dumb decisions when I was 16. Yeah, I think it was just because I had no, I had no fear about it. Like, there wasn't like, you know, like, like I'd never heard of anything about Bigfoot or anything like that or anything crazy. So, I mean, there was nothing really to be scared about. And at that point, I think I was already too close. I think I was already in enough shock at that point to where the only thing that I thought about was just going straight. Like I didn't want to turn back or start backing away and stuff. And just, and, and I think that was my only thought was like that fight or flight mode. And I was just like, I'm out of here. Yeah, I get all of that. Definitely. What, what did you think it was at the time? Um, I honestly didn't know what it was, man. I mean, I had seen enough animals throughout my day and stuff like that. And, and growing up in Florida, I mean, you've seen, you know, I've seen elk around in some places and I've seen hogs, pretty big hogs and some alligators and stuff. And me and my brothers, man, we played out in the woods for until we, until that time frame, we played out in the woods every single day from dusk, from, from the beginning of the day to the end of the night. Like it was just, there was kind of nothing to be afraid of out there. I mean, you had your animals and snakes and stuff like that, but I, I didn't think anything of it. Like I didn't think it was, I knew it wasn't a person because they don't make people that size and that kind of like wide and to have it like in the area that it was like, it wasn't just like a normal, you know, it wasn't like 200 feet was a house. The next house was like a quarter of a mile away. So it was in between a lot of things and it was just very random growing up there and stuff like that to see this kind of a, uh, this thing that big and that wide. And it just, it just freaked the hell out of me, man. Yeah. It makes me wonder what the creature was doing. Just kind of standing there. Um, not that I have not heard that before. I definitely have. Um, tell me about the next incident that happened to you. Um, I, I know you guys were four wheel in, but kind of walk us into it. What were you doing and, and what happened? Um, so we ended up moving from this, uh, this little house that we were in a little too, uh, double wide. We ended up moving to this other area and what we called it in Florida, it was called the prairie. So it basically butted up against the forest preserve. And as a crow flies, I would say it was probably about eight or nine miles from the original, the first time that I had seen this creature. So out on the prairie, there's, there's, there was less people out there than there was, uh, um, at the other house that we lived. Um, just because it was a kind of a newer area and it, and it was right up next to a forest preserve. So not many people lived there because it was so far away from town. It was about 45 minutes from town. And, um, we had just, uh, we had just moved out there and I met a couple buddies and stuff like that, that, you know, we kind of all went to the same school and got off at the same bus stop. And, uh, they lived about two miles away from me. And we had a couple, uh, a couple four wheelers that we would just kind of, put together and just kind of mess around with and stuff like that. There was a lot of trails to ride and stuff. 
so we would always go out there and then um i think it was about the time frame for this one was probably i would say at least like six or seven months after this so after this i mean i had forgotten about the whole situation you know it just kind of went about our business i mean it, it, it didn't do nothing to me it didn't it, i wasn't that scared of it obviously so we kind of just you know we went out for an evening it was about probably about nine o'clock ten o'clock in the evening and we go riding around these trails and at the prairie there's a lot of um a lot of open fields and then in like certain areas you have patches of like huge trees and stuff like that the same kind of concept you got like sawgrass palmetto fans pine trees and oak trees it's all just bunches and um the people who live out there or the, the some of the families that live out there they um they have like some people have cattle some have goats some have cows and stuff like that so they put like in random spots at the time that this place got built up is there was no like like hey if you if you owned like an acreage of land you kind of just owned whatever was around unless somebody bought up something that was close to you so people would let their horses and everything just kind of roam around and people started putting up cow feeders is what we called them so basically they're like little little huts that just held feed and stuff like that so we come around this bend and we're all just kind of following each other and stuff and i'm the first one and i come around this bend and there's a cow feeder probably about 10 to 15 feet away from a big a big uh opening with a bunch of trees in it and stuff like that and i went past it and the headlights hit the uh the cow feeder and i'm like wait like there's no way that i just saw something there so I, I I slam on the brakes and I kind of reverse and I shine the lights on it. And at this point, I can see this creature that looked almost 100% identical to the one that I had seen maybe six months ago. And my friends kind of whipped past me a little bit and they're like, what the heck? Why did you stop? So they kind of reverse a little bit and um, they pull up next to me and they're like what what'd you stop for like why would you run out of gas or something like that and i'm like no nothing like that and then they kind of see where i'm looking at and they both just look at focus at that and um, i think one of them let out like the, like a huge cuss word and he was just like what that is, is that and i'm like I, I don't know man but we're probably about 60 feet from from this cow feeder and stuff and we can see this thing clear as day. And it was taller than the cow feeders. And they're usually about six feet um, at the at the biggest ones. And these two guys, like both my friends, well, who I thought were my friends, they don't even hesitate. They throw their four-wheelers in the drive and they take off. Um, and I stay there looking at this thing. And I'm just like, I think at this point I'm in shock because then I go right back to the previous incident when I saw um, the creature that looks identical to this almost six months ago it's just standing there like it's just breathing it's not moving i don't know if it was trying to eat the feed or something like that. i don't know what it was doing but um it felt like i was watching this thing for like 10 minutes but it was probably only like 10 more seconds to be honest so then i i throw the four wheeler into drive and i take off as quick as i can and we used to play this joke like all three of us so on a four wheeler you have like a on and off and a reserve on your fuel well, at the previous spot that we had stopped at, we were chatting at, they had turned my four-wheeler to reserve. So reserve will only get you maybe 800 feet before you before your uh, four-wheeler cuts off. So I I take off and I'm like in straight panic mode at this point. Like I don't I don't want anything to do with this. I don't want to look at this thing. Like this thing is gonna give me nightmares. That's all that I'm thinking. And I take off and about 800 feet, the four wheeler completely dies. I'm talking like lights shut off, everything shuts off on this thing. So then I'm like panicking at this point because now I'm thinking, oh, dang, this thing's going to come after me. It's going to see me like it knows where I am. Like this four wheeler is loud. And I'm, at this point, I'm screaming my head off. What the heck? Like, why did my four wheeler shut off? And then I reach down and look and um, I kind of like, I guess when you're like into like a, like a panic mode, you're kind of my fine dexterity kind of went away. And it's a really fine knob that you have to turn. And I think like, oh, man, they probably turned my fuel off. So I turned the fuel back on and then I'd sit there for like another 10 seconds trying to start it up and stuff. And I start this thing up and I just take off. I didn't look back once because I, if you've ever seen taillights on a four wheeler, they kind of show you about four or five feet of 
as, as far as you can see. And I didn't want to look back and see this thing like right on my butt and, the, and me just panic and wreck. And then I'm like, damn, I'm dead or something like that or something crazy. Um, but then we kind of just got out of there. So we all get back to their houses and stuff like that, which is probably about a, about a two and a half, three mile ride, which feels like I drove like a hundred miles with my adrenaline going. I mean, I'm hitting branches, everything. Like I was straight lining for the highway. Like there was no, like it was no tomorrow. Um, and I get back to their house. They got there maybe, I would say maybe about five, 10 minutes before me. And they're just waiting in their barn and stuff like that. And they were freaking out because they're thinking like I'm dead or something crazy like that because they remembered that they cut the gas off on my full wheeler. So I whip in and stuff like that. And of course, our first questions are like, what the heck is that? Like, what did we see? And I'm like, and but I didn't tell them the first time that I had saw that one previously because I, I mean, I didn't really at that point. I'm just like, I don't I like this is the first time I've seen it to them. So so and I don't want to seem like a weirdo like this thing is following me or something like that. So I'm like. I'm like, I don't know, man. I'm like, but did you guys see it just like me? And they were like, yeah, yeah, no, we saw it. It took us at least three or four days to kind of calm down. And we would see each other in school and stuff like that. And just like that thousand yard stare, like all three of us had. And it and it freaked us all out. Like nobody's business, man. It was crazy. Yeah, I had to chuckle a little bit about your buddies turning your turning it on in the reserve tank and Made me think of uh, when me and my brothers all got motorcycles, or a little brother, we did that to him, and we were like, ah, oh, this is teaching him good life skills. He'll figure it out. Let him go troubleshoot it, and uh, I guess boys will be boys. But um, So when you pulled up on the four-wheeler, and you're looking at this thing, can you kind of describe what you saw? Yeah, so the, the thing that stuck out to me the most was um, when I first pulled up to it, it had a rank, like a nasty smell to it. It almost smelled like, um, like if, if anybody's ever been hog hunting and stuff, you have wild boar and stuff, and they have like a rank musky smell to them. So that was the first thing that I noticed in the air was this thing smelled like, like it had been through, like it hadn't showered or bathed for like months. And um, the way it looked, so its face was flat. Its its um its eyes were kind of set back into its face, and what I could see mostly was its teeth. They didn't look like human teeth, one hundred percent. There's no way that those were human teeth, but they weren't white. They were like a like an off yellow, like 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 you hadn't brushed your teeth for like like weeks and stuff like that. Um, the thing that I remember one hundred percent is the way the hair looked. So the way the hair looked is it started out as like a black at the roots. And then as it kind of got longer, it went into like a brownish, a brownish color almost. Um, it had really long arms, the same as the other one. And the, the weird thing that I could see was it was kind of chilly that night, not blizzard temperatures, but enough to where that late night you could see like your breath. And you could see this thing breathing on top of the, uh, the roof of this cow feeder which is one thing like 100%. I will never forget that ever a day in my life. Yeah, I get it, man. Definitely. Um, you know, a lot of times when people see these creatures, they'll say, well, it, it reminded me more of an animal, kind of like a non-human primate. And then there's people that will go, no, it didn't remind me of an animal at all. It reminded me of a human. And then some people will say, you know, somewhere in between a, a man and an animal and, and, Quite frankly, other people say neither. You know, it's something completely separate. When you were looking at this creature and it's by this cow feeder, what was kind of your impression? I mean, I've, you know, I've seen I've seen pictures and stuff of like gorillas and monkeys and stuff like that. And keep in mind, I've never done any research on Bigfoot or anything like that prior to this. Um, and I've seen people before. It, it didn't look like either one of them. This thing looked out, looked straight up like it was out of like a horror movie. Like the worst kind of, the way the arms and how big it was, you can obviously tell it wasn't a human. It was just, this This thing was so big. It just, it, it was just outrageous at how big this thing was. And being um, at the time, I think I was like just turned 17 or something. Like that, and you, I'd never seen anything this big. But still, the long arms and just just it just didn't look anything human like or ape like to me. Yeah, I'm I'm curious. Did the creature did it freeze? You know, kind of like when you see kids play freeze tag. Uh, it's reported that these creatures will do that. They'll just stand still and just not not move. 
Was it doing that or was it looking directly at you? No, it didn't. I didn't really get a look at the eyes. I don't think it froze on me. I think it froze on me because I was the last one there for that last little bit. I, I didn't see if it was focused on me or my friend to my right or my friend to my left. It was just, it was just kind of standing. I'm thinking it was, it thought that it was covered enough behind that cow feeder that we couldn't see it. Like, I don't, I don't know, but it didn't, it didn't seem like to be panicked or scared of us at all. Yeah. And I'm sure the feeling wasn't mutual. I, I would have been like, you have been like, I'm getting the hell out of here. Um, I know that you served our country and, um, you know, I hold people who serve in our military in very high regard, admire them, because uh, it's not the easiest gig on the planet, and it is volunteer. And you were just getting out of boot camp when you run it, had a run-in with a, a wolf or something, and it was kind of a strange encounter. Um, did this happen many years later? Um, yeah. So actually, no, it wasn't that. It wasn't that long after that because I joined the Marine Corps um, directly out of high school. So I think I was about 17 when the second incident happened. And then I was 18 at the time. So, so not that much, maybe like a year and a half after, after the second incident. Um, still in the same area, though. Um, my parents, they, once they moved out to the prairie, they never, they, they never moved again. That was kind of like where they liked it. They liked the woods. They liked the area and stuff like that. They don't like people. So I guess is the best way to say it. Um, so I was back um from boot leave so i basically uh, did my three months in boot camp and you kind of get like a week and a half to kind of just relax and stuff like that visit family before you go to your next training so i get back to the house and stuff like that and I, i'm bored there's not really much to do um in this small town so i'm out visiting my parents and stuff like that and um my dad has a bunch of dogs like he uses a fence as dogs he has 12 13 dogs and he's probably going to, well, he probably doesn't listen to stuff, but he just, he likes his privacy, <laughs> I guess is the way to say it. But um, every day he'll walk a dog. He'll walk every single one of them the same time, every time. Um, and I just kind of thought like, well, I'm already here, dad. Like, why don't you just let me take one of the dogs out? So, um, and I can just go get a run in. Like uh, at that point, you know, I'm all high and mighty, like just got out of boot camp. I'm like, oh yeah, I could run as, as far as the eye can see and stuff like that. So I kind of just take one of the dogs it's on like a probably like a five foot little nylon rope and i just take the dog for a run i get about almost a mile and a half away from my parents house and it's um it's not nighttime it's probably about like four in the evening so but the only bad part about it is out in these woods and stuff like that when the sun starts to go down it's it gets fairly dark quick because the trees are so tall and stuff but at this point in time you know i'm not thinking like anything's going to be out there. I might see like an armadillo or a snake or something like that. So I'm just running down these little uh, four wheeler trails and stuff. Just, just kind of just, just moseying along with the dog. I get to this point um, in the road where it's kind of a straight shot about 300 feet um, on this four wheeler trail. And I just had a funny feeling. I'm like, man, there's something, it, it feels like something's watching me. Like, like you get like a weird feeling sometimes when somebody's staring at you and stuff like that. And I had this just weird feeling, man, that something was watching me. So I just kind of stopped in my tracks because the dogs are pretty good at, you know, kind of noticing things and stuff like that. And um, I, I stop and I just try and listen to see what is going on. And I'm like, what the heck? And then I look in front of me and about, I would say about 30 feet in front of me. I kid you not. I see the the mangiest, ugliest ki or, um, wolf that I've ever seen. This isn't like a like a coyote that weighs like 30 pounds. This is like a, a 85 pound, 90 pound wolf. And I'm like, no, there's no way this thing's out here. Like it's, it's right at the end of the day. Like, what is this thing doing out here? I look at the dog and I'm like, oh no, this dog, cause these dogs my dad had were bred for hog hunting. So they would go after anything. I'm talking anything that moves they would go after. I look down at the dog and the dog isn't even focused on this thing the wolf basically gets right in the middle of the road and just stops and stares at us like just froze didn't move didn't do anything i take a look at the dog and the dog is looking to the right into the woods and um i'm like well what the heck like why isn't this dog focused on this 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 um wolf in front of us like what the heck is going on like this thing's about to attack us and and i'm sorry dog i'm gonna let you go and i'm running like that's what i'm thinking 
And um, all of a sudden, I just hear trees breaking, branches breaking, and all this stuff. And this wolf, I kid you not, within two seconds is gone. Like, it doesn't even hesitate. Like, it doesn't care about us. It doesn't care about what's going on. All I knew is that whatever was chasing this thing scared it, like, like almost like the first time that I was. Like, it, it scared me just that much. And this thing took off, and whatever was chasing it never crossed the tree line where the four-wheeler trail cut off. Whatever it was kind of ran away in parallel and scared this wolf completely off. So we just kind of turned tail and ran the other way back to the house. And I just put the dog up and shut my mouth and went on about my business. I don't know what it was, but it was something big enough to scare away this, this, um, this wolf, which had, had, which as far as I'm concerned, wolves don't have too many things that they're terrified of. Yeah, you're right. Wolves really aren't terrified of much and they'll throw you a real beating if you get too close. I didn't know that there was wolves in Florida. There's a few of them, man. You don't see them. There's not a lot of them. They're all indigenous to Florida, but either people buy them and stuff like that, and they get them illegally, and then they just kind of let them go. And then um, we, I maybe saw four or five my entire 18 years that I lived there, but none like this one. Like this one was just by itself. Sometimes you see like one or two and stuff like that. But yeah, I mean, they, there's there's wolves in Florida, man. It's It's insane. Yeah, sounds like your parents are on an active property. Um, have you ever heard vocalizations or stuff you really couldn't pinpoint uh, what kind of animal it was around this property? No, I mean, I have, I've never, I never even thought about it. Like, um, you know, you would kind of go outside and just listen to the, um, like the sounds of like the woods and stuff like that. But there's all kinds of things. And, you know, my brothers and stuff lived out there and I never once asked them because I didn't want them to think anything. But I never heard anything like this, not not once in my entire life living out there. Yeah, and then you see this wolf, and then uh, you hear what sounds like something large, you know, breaking branches and coming in that general direction. I would imagine that moment in time you were thinking, I've seen this movie before, and, you know, kind of flashbacks to that first time it happened to you. Right, mm-hmm. And it was just like, I don't know, man, but like, like I'm whatever was in those woods, man, I'm glad it was there because with, with seeing that, the um, wolf out there, it was just, it, it's and like, I just got out of boot camp, So I thought I was all high and mighty and stuff like that. But seeing that it took me right down to like, I was like, I was a 13 year old kid. Like I felt so small. And all I thought was, I'm sorry, dog. That's the end for you, bud. Cause I just gotta, I just gotta get out of here and I know you're going to stop and fight it. So <laughs> yeah i hear you <laughs> i might leave someone else's dog behind but not my own i'm not even sure if i would do that but i get what you're saying the last incident that i want to talk about uh, happened in uh, jacksonville north carolina i believe uh, and you were serving at the time did this happen on base yeah so on base um so so on jacksonville like in the in the marine corps you have all these um different ranges and stuff like that where you go out into the woods and they're in the middle of nowhere i mean i'm talking it's it's hundreds of acres that just go into woods and thick um just shrubs and stuff like that and of course that's where the marine corps likes to train the best is um in the worst positions you could ever think of so um i think i was just like like this one happened let's see so i deployed in 2011 so this is about 2013 2004 it was right towards the end of me getting out of the marine corps um, it was kind of my last deployment. So we do like pre and pre deployment training and stuff like that. And we were doing, um, we were doing like patrols at night and stuff like that. So we have MVGs and we have like our black jacket and our rifle and stuff like that. But we don't have any rounds or anything like that, but we just kind of do like training and stuff to prepare you. So I had just come to that, this unit. So I wasn't really, I didn't really know too many people. I just kind of got thrown onto this thing. We, we, we started doing patrols at night and you always do patrols at night. They try and sleep deprive you as much as they can and stuff like that. And we do this patrol at night and I'm the last one in the patrol because at that point I was like a team leader and stuff like that. So I was like, well, I want to make sure nobody comes up behind us because, you know, you have op four who are in the same platoon as you trying to, you know, trying to like disrupt what you're doing and stuff like that. And it's, it's pitch black out there. So with MVGs, like you need ambient light to see better and stuff like that. 
so the MVGs aren't really that well, and they only go over one eyeball. So the other eye is just kind of seeing just nothing but darkness. And um, I we get to this point in the patrol, and like you're supposed to look back like every six feet as you as you're walking and turn back and look and stuff like that. And most people do it like every 20, 30 feet or something. And I do it one time and right next to this set of pine trees that we were walking by, um, I kind of see something pop out. It was just, uh, it was, it was kind of like the first experience I had. It was just kind of a shadowy figure. And I'm like, okay, well, I don't know what that is. Maybe it's a person that's coming up behind us and stuff like that to do this. And then we just kind of, and we're walking slow, you know, we're not at like a fast pace because we have time and we're just, we're just trying to make sure we got all our fundamentals correctly. So we walk I'm, and I walk again. And this time I, I do the actual three to five steps. Cause I'm like, man, that was kind of creepy. And um, I look back and the thing is just kind of moving with us, whatever it is. And I'm like, no, man, this can't like, like, is my life like this benign? And I'm like, I'm like, what the heck is going on? Like, is this thing just like following me or is this something I'm seeing in my head? So and I'm the last one. I'm like, well, I don't want to say nothing. You know, I'm on a, we're on a patrol. I can't just yell out like, oh my God, there's someone behind us and stuff, you know? So we just kind of keep walking. And at, at one point I just kind of turned completely all the way around and just start walking backwards for maybe 10 to 15 feet. And this thing, every chance it could move or thinking that it couldn't, that we weren't seeing it, it would move just a little bit closer. And it never, it never really showed itself completely, like completely out of, out behind the trees and the shrubs and stuff. But whatever it was, it, it just, it was kind of trailing us about 20 to 30 feet behind us. And, um, we kind of get back, like we get closer to our, our, um, our operating base where we like got our tents and stuff set up and it starts to get a little lighter. And we get to that point and I look back one final time and this thing is just still like, it's just kind of like leaning out, peeking out, like to see who we were or what we looked like and stuff like that. And then I get back to the group and you're supposed to do like a debrief after you kind of, you know, after you do a patrol, you do a big debrief and say like what you saw and stuff like that or what was going on or things people need to do better. And our um, um, CEO was there and he was just, he was like, so how'd everything go? And I'm like, um, did you guys have like some op four guys out there who were trying to like, disrupt anything they were like no it was just a standard night patrol there was no one everyone's here like no one's no one's out there and i was like what the heck i'm like so so then it just threw my meter up like i was like what the heck was that like it just did it just threw me completely off because i was thinking they were gonna be like yeah that was joe that was joe schmo who was out there to try and see what you guys were doing but they were like no like all the squads are here they're waiting on you to get back so they can do it again and then that night when i went in my tent i was just like man I was like, what the heck was that? Like, it just didn't, like, it didn't make any noises. It didn't trip over anything. Cause when you walk at night with MVGs, a person like walking with that stuff, you make a lot of noise cause you can't really, your depth perception is way off, but no one else heard anything. The next guy in front of me who was about 10 feet in front of me, he didn't hear anything. And he was looking back too. And, and no one else saw this thing except for me. I was like, man, I was like, is my mind starting to build this thing up or is it something? I don't know, man. But it was it was really weird, man. It was a really weird night. Yeah, sounds like it. And I hear encounters like this all the time on military bases, uh, you know, being in Washington, uh, Fort Lewis. I get reports out of there all the time, uh, you know, spanning many, many years. And it, they're very similar encounters like this where. Um, guys in the military will report, hey, something was pacing us. I couldn't really see what it was, but something was there. I mean, time and time again, and it's not obviously just Fort Lewis. I hear about it on almost every military base uh, we have. There's something weird going on uh, or guys are experiencing you know, strange things out there. Can I ask you, James, I know after all these years and you've had this experience, I know you don't live in Florida now. Your folks still do. But, and I appreciate you sharing what happened to you. Um, if someone were to ask you, what is Sasquatch? What would you say to them? There's obviously no wrong answer. I'm just curious on your opinion. Um, I mean, you know, in, in Florida, man, we got a lot of the, uh, the Indian reservations out there, man. And I've, and I've heard some stories and stuff like that from everything people have seen out there. Um, I, I honestly, I don't have an answer for that. I mean, I've seen it like, 
like, you know, some people are like, oh, man, I believe in aliens and stuff like that. I mean, but when I bring it up, like, hey, you know, like, I believe in I believe in Bigfoot. They're like, well, why? I'm like, because I've seen it before. But I don't think it's it, it ain't a man. That's 100 percent sure. And it ain't an ape. It's something else that just it wants to go and do its own thing. And it's one thing that I don't want to, you know, I live in the suburbs now and I live in a cul-de-sac with a bunch of houses, ain't too many woods around here, man. So it's not, it's definitely not anything that I want to look forward to anytime soon, but I mean, it's just, I feel like it's its own thing and it wants to do whatever it wants to do. And no matter what happens or what goes on, it'll avoid whatever it needs to avoid and it'll, it'll continue on and live on whatever the heck it is, man. So, (laughs) Yeah, I hear you. It's so hard to figure out what these things are because they're it's such a weird topic. And you know, even though everyone's encounters are kind of the same, uh, they're kind of not. I mean, there's so much to unfold from this topic. So I, I get it, man, and I respect your answer. I I kind of feel the same way most of the time. Um, and I know you don't live in Florida, as I said before, but your folks still do. It'd be kind of cool to go and check out that area to see if they still have activity there. Yeah, I mean, I haven't been back. You know, I, I visit Florida and visit my parents maybe once, like every five years. I'll, I'll tell you one thing, though, as I'm, I'm a 32 year old man at this point, and I am completely and utterly terrified of the dark because of these events. I don't I'm I'm good with other people and stuff, but alone, man, it just my mind starts to wander and think about these things and stuff like that. And it's just not. You know, it's it's I I definitely wouldn't go back out to my parents property and be like, you know, what, let me just go for a walk in the woods at night. Like, it's just not it's just not something I want to do, man. So, <laughs> Yeah, I get it, man. I get it. Um, and, and who could blame you, to be honest with you? I really appreciate you coming on and sharing what happened to you. And uh, thank you so much for your time. I really enjoyed chatting with you and thank you for your service. Oh, yeah, for sure, man. It was a pleasure talking to you, Wes. And next up on the show, I want to welcome Mike. Mike, thanks for coming on, man. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you again. And I'm fa- I was fascinated by your account. I know this happened in Michigan, and we're going back to uh, 1981. You were just a young boy when this happened. I think you were nine years old from what I read. Uh, if you would, would you take us back to that moment? Kind of tell us what you were doing and what happened. Okay, well, I grew up in a subdivision that was really close to, back then was a really large golf course and a nature center that bordered the Saginaw River. And approximately, I don't know, it was about a mile from where we lived. You know, it was a pretty good sized neighborhood. A lot of kids, you know, the kids played in that area. We went to the neighborhood. We always frequented the uh, nature center trails that walked out, you know, right to the river. There was quite a bit of forest back then. I think things have changed now, but, you know, as a young boy, you, you know, you don't sleep that great. You're up all the time playing and stuff. Well, I just happened to be awake in the middle of the night. I want to say it was probably one o'clock in the morning. And, and uh, I just happened to be peering out the window at my school, which was kitty corner from the house. And uh, we had a street light intersection where you could, it was all lit up. You could see it. And, this was probably the tail end of winter, if I remember right. It's, it was still cold. We still had some ice around, and uh, you know the kids played hockey across the street at the um, you know the park and stuff like that. I looked out the window in the middle of the night, and you know I saw somebody standing in the intersection. It appeared to be a really tall guy with long hair. I thought to myself, "Wow, that guy's got really long hair." And as it stepped out into the light, it was covered in hair. And it was really tall. And the first thing that came into my head, you know, being 1981, which was, you know, right around Star Wars, was, wow, that's Chewbacca, you know. (laughs) The only thing that I could think of. It stood there for a few minutes and kind of looked around before it moved. And then it only took a couple of steps and it was gone. Um, You know, being young and stuff like that, I didn't think anything of it. I wasn't scared or anything. But the next morning I woke up and I told my mom about it. you know, she said, of course, you know, like a mother would, that, oh, you must have dreamt it. You know, you had a really vivid dream. You know, it, it really didn't happen. So I just kind of blew it off as a kid, thought, well, she's probably correct. 
you know, maybe I watched too much TV or whatever and got ready to go play with the kids down to the hockey rink, uh, suited up and went down the road. And as I walked over to the snowbank in the same direction where this thing had walked, there was tracks in the snow, bare footprint tracks. And I remember putting my fingers into the toe marks where the big toes were. And I thought, wow, that's weird. Why would somebody be walking barefooted, you know? And I didn't think anything about Bigfoot or anything like that. Like I said, I referenced it as Chewbacca because I really didn't know any better. Well, I went back and told my mother that, and <laughs> she said the same thing. Now that's just got to be something else, you know? Somebody stepped in there, or whatever, with a boot, and it looked like a you know, footprint, you know? And so I just kind of blew it off over the years and never thought anything of it. And then here we are today, and you know, you go through some of the stories that you hear from people and, so I started doing some listening to, you know, obviously, your podcast and other things. And topics would come up that referred to the same things that I remember. And I thought, man, that's I need to tell somebody about this. And the only other person I've ever told about it was my wife. and I uh, probably told her 20 years ago. And the subject never came up again, really, until recently where, you know, we started to uh, I, I stumbled across your podcast and listened to a few of them. And I thought, man, this is this is pretty interesting. Yet. I'd like to talk about this now. and. I blew it off because, you know, I, I have a, you know, pretty high profile job in the community here. And, uh, I really don't speak about things like that. We live in a real, uh, very rural area now, uh, Northeast Michigan, which is about 120 miles North where it's all wooded. And I've been in the woods all my life up here since, you know, we left the Saginaw area and I've never seen anything like that, but I've, heard a lot of different things that I just kind of blew off too. Yeah, I think it's fascinating. I know it's a really short encounter, but I'm I'm fascinated by it. And you know, even at that age, you know, being nine, ten years old, your mind goes to Chewbacca. And whenever I interview um kids, usually off the air, um it, that's kind of where their mind goes. They don't really say, well it was a guy. They'll say it was a monkey man, Chewbacca um, you know, they have all, they'll kind of make their own verbiage for what they're seeing. Um, did you ever get a chance to talk to your mom later in life and go, Hey, that wasn't a guy. And I wasn't seeing things that night. Actually, it wasn't that maybe a week or two ago before I decided to, uh, send you the message about it, that I asked her about it, if she remembered anything and she didn't really remember it. And I, and I thought, well, I guess I can understand that she probably blew it off as a dream also, kind of like I did. But yeah, it's just, it's, it was a strange encounter that I couldn't explain. And, you know, the, that area has since been turned into a, a wildlife refuge. So, uh, the golf course is shut down and it's all a huge wooded area now. So I, I, it's hard to say there's a lot of acreage right there. It just was strange that, you know, looking at it now at this age, what would something like that be doing in a, a residential area, you know, so close? It's almost like it was just, you know, uh, wandering around searching for something. I'm not sure what. Yeah, the strange part, though, Mike, I would say most encounters happen around residential areas. You know, the the thought of, well, I got to go 100 miles out in the middle of nowhere to see something like this it, in my opinion is delusional because most encounters if you look on a map uh, they kind of live on the outskirts of humanity which is strange yeah i can imagine and, and the thing is, is as kids we roamed those areas all the time and uh we walked the nature trails and you know we were back in that creepy golf course where you know it bordered the river and stuff like that and there was an old factory over there and just yeah, it's it's a different story. It's so cool to have you on, Mike, because I know you do have a high profile job and I don't want you to go into it, but it's really cool to have you on. You know, you have this encounter back in 1981. You think it's a dream or your mother convinces you it's a dream. You get up the next morning, you go out to play with your friends and everything, and then you see these tracks, you know, which obviously it wasn't a dream. Um, let me ask you, after all these years of looking into it, what do you think Sasquatch is? You know, I've thought about that a lot, and it's really hard to understand what it would be. I guess until there's more evidence of it, I really don't know what you would call it. I guess it's to me, it's so unexplained. Yeah, I hear you. It is hard to explain. It's hard to know really what what they are. 
Um, would you want to see another one again? I would. In fact, um, you know, I, I live up north now where it's all wooded, so I'm out all the time. And, you know, I've seen strange things out there like, you know, footprints of bear, you know, bear footprints of like a human foot, like on a roadway. And, you know, you're like, why would somebody be walking barefoot here? But it wasn't an unordinary size. It was, you know, just like a, a normal person. But I'm talking about a super, like a real out in the woods setting where there's no houses around. You would you'd be like, well, that's kind of strange. But, um, yeah, I think if, if I had the opportunity, I would like to see something like that. Yeah, I can understand that, especially with your encounter. And like I said, it's so cool that you found evidence the next day that what you saw is what you saw. And uh, I, I know it was a short encounter, but I really appreciate you coming on, Mike. I enjoy chatting with you. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks again, Mike. And that's it for tonight, everyone. Remember, if you've had an encounter, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. If you get a chance, check out sasquatchronicles.com. You can become a member and get additional shows. Until next time, everyone. What you're about to hear are thought to be the sounds and vocalizations of a California Bigfoot, a gigantic man-like creature of legendary repute whose kind have been sighted and tracked but never caught for decades throughout West Coast mountain ranges. Imagine yourself as I was, with three other men cramped within the confines of a small but ruggedly built shelter located in a remote region of the High Sierra. It's after dark, but outside the shelter, which is constructed of heavy logs and branches and resembles a beaver's lodge, moonlight filters through the trees, brightening thin patches of snow here and there. Downhill, near a small spring which feeds an alder-choked ravine, there's a stove where you cook your meals and gather for warmth against the autumn chill. Uphill, a dense stand of timber faces the shelter and remains dark and foreboding despite the moonlight. It was a sheep camp at one time, then it was a hunting camp used by a handful of men and their families. But it's yet a different kind of camp today because of something which happened before you came, something which has continued to happen off and on, and something which, for the first time in your presence, is happening now. We'd bedded down for the night. At least that's how we wanted it to appear. We'd rolled a big upright log into the space between two tree trunks, which serves as the shelter's door, and were lying quietly on our sleeping bags inside, pretending to sleep. Suddenly, there was a whistle-like call outside, coming from somewhere uphill. It was a big sound, and it was startling, for it seemed that no man could have made it. And there were no other men in the area anyway. I'd been warned that it might happen, but a chill surged through me as one of my friends whispered, that's him. They're with us. Within moments, there were other sounds, huge sounds coming from the same direction. There were sounds I'd never heard before, and my knees began to tremble involuntarily. It was a gibberish, a chattering, strange and eerie, almost like an oddly distorted human tongue. Yet it couldn't be, I thought. One of my companions began calling out, softly but in a firm voice, Here, Biggie, come on in. Come on, big fella, let's be friends. Was he joking? I could hardly believe he was serious until I realized that he and the others had been trying to coax the creatures within view for months now, and they'd heard the weird vocalizations many times, and that the calling out had become routine. I got up unsteadily and squeezed my head and shoulders up through a small opening in the shelter's roof. I had to see what was making the noise and try to photograph it. Nearly a half hour passed and the vocal exchange continued. Then two of my friends stepped outside, brought food from the camp stove area, and placed it uphill in a clearing where I could watch. I wondered what would happen, but nothing did until the men were inside the shelter again and out of view. Then there was an angry display. It came on suddenly and started my knees trembling again. Was the thing about to rush down and attack? Here's how it sounded. Listen now to a living legend as it was recorded during these moments. <laughs> Oh boy,
On side one, you've heard what was probably bluffing behavior. A chest-slapping display followed by what seems to be two creatures arguing between themselves, then a series of more conciliatory vocalizations. You've also heard the voice of one of my companions calling out to the creatures, and what sometimes appears to be their prompt response. For the recording, a stereophonic cassette recorder was located within the shelter, with a wire leading to a remote microphone taped to a tree outside, several yards uphill. The voice of my companion was coming from inside the shelter, while the voice of the creatures was coming from outside, more than 30 yards away, and beyond my view from the shelter's roof, from within the dense stand of timber uphill. From this, you can gauge the dimensions of the vocalizations, the awesome magnitude of the sounds as they reached our ears. Even though they seem very close to the microphone, they're actually far away, perhaps even as much as 150 feet, in my own judgment, from having heard them firsthand. In all, on this night of October 21st, 1972, what seemed to be two Bigfoot creatures vocalized and carried on for more than an hour and a half before apparently tiring of the game and wandering off. As evidenced from their huge footprints the following morning, not once had they stepped into a clearing or area where they would have risked being seen and photographed. Yet they had moved about with apparent ease, at one point almost soundlessly approaching behind the cover of trees to within a few yards of the shelter's door and the hole in the roof where I'd maintained my post. If they'd wanted to bring harm, there was every opportunity. Instead, it seemed as if they were rather contemptuous of us and drawn in by curiosity or perhaps hunger, even though the food, a few apples, and a pot of fruit-flavored drink was not taken. Were our efforts to make friends with them to any avail? Listen now to another sequence of sound 
as the same gentleman previously heard stands beside the shelter outside in my view from the roof and strikes up an extraordinary exchange. Like actors on a stage, there could be little doubt, it seemed, that the creatures, whatever they might be, were playing to us. We were their audience. Listen now to some primitive rhythm and blues, or as it were, rhythm and blahs. Over the course of four years, beginning the summer of 1971, sounds such as these you've just listened to have been heard and recorded many times in and about this High Sierra camp. I personally listened to them on several occasions, and once for a full night in sub-freezing weather, which stopped all electronically devised methods of detection, including my tape recorder and several self-initiating camera traps. Is the sound source truly Bigfoot, the hair-covered, gigantic, man-like creature of legend? Or is it, as some people will suppose, simply an elaborate hoax? A human voice, or the voices of known animals, artfully manipulated and amplified to sound like a very big and unknown creature. As the tapes have yet to be verified by a photograph of the creature, and even as I, myself, have not yet actually seen the creature, one would be on safe ground to reserve some doubt. However, careful tape analysis, acoustical tests, and two years of intensive investigation of the circumstances under which the sounds have occurred strongly suggest that they may be exactly what they seem to be, Bigfoot sounding off. What can be said on the basis of scientific scrutiny is that they originated at the time of recording in this camp area and that they were spontaneous. This means that if the vocalizations were human-made, a person capable of remaining undetected would have to have been on the scene dozens of days and nights throughout 20 seasonal months when the camp was occupied and the sounds or other evidence occurred. To obtain sound fidelity and sufficient amplification, a person would have to have packed dozens of pounds of well-insulated, unbreakable electronic gear. To obtain simultaneous sounds, several similarly equipped Confederates would have been needed. 
To create the footprints, each would have to have had a walking step of from four to seven feet. To reach the area, each would have had to have climbed in rough terrain, a minimum of 2,500 feet in elevation for each staging. All this without detection by from two to six watchful observers. Is it really the creature Bigfoot then which is so incredible? By way of a parting word, perhaps this is the kind of commentary Bigfoot would have on the matter.